If you spend enough time cultivating a reputation as a collector of outdated electronics, some pretty weird things start to happen. Case in point, this PC here. This small form factor Dell Optiplex GX520 was given to me, free of charge, from some neighbors who as near as I could tell just wanted to avoid having to make a trip to the local thrift store. My initial thought at receiving this thing was, I could probably find somebody who needs a basic word processing and email machine for this. The thought that came immediately afterwards was, but first I ought to see how well it games. Now, when you first pick up an old PC like this, usually the best thing to do is Google the model and see what information you can dig up about it. In fact, if you're at a yard sale and you'll be paying money for the thing, I'd say you should do that before you actually take the machine. In my case, I, uh, I just took it. It was free after all. But a quick inspection was enough to tell me that I was running an Intel Pentium 4 processor with an HT on the sticker that I didn't recognize. Inside, there wasn't much of anything surprising. Two sticks of 512 megabytes of DDR2 RAM, a couple of fat IDE cables, one for a disk drive, and another for a floppy drive that thankfully wasn't present, a single SATA port on the motherboard for the hard drive, and exactly zero spare power supply connections. The motherboard and cooler are proprietary Dell units, which means the cooling is pretty effective, but also won't fit on any other motherboards without some modding. Now, a few tidbits about this machine. The Pentium 4 chip powering this mess is clocked at over 3 GHz, which was the primary advantage of the Pentium 4 over competing chips at the time, though the cost and power that accompanied those clock speeds left the playing field fairly equal in terms of the bigger picture. In order to overcome the clock speed disadvantage, AMD started pushing multi-core chips down into the mainstream market, which left Intel scrambling for a generation before they could launch their Core Duo processors to compete. The processor in this Optiplex is from the scrambling period, and actually features an early version of Intel's hyper-threading technology. That's what the HT on the sticker stands for, and this is actually the first I've heard of it. There were other configurations of the GX520 available, featuring Celeron D processors and half as much RAM, and from what I can tell, you're far more likely to stumble across one of those if you see this model number. The graphics on the motherboard are Intel's Integrated Media Accelerator 950, which is, to put it mildly, an enormous pile of crap in comparison to even the most basic discrete graphics card. And I mean that. Literally any discrete graphics chip would wipe the floor with this stuff. And yes, Intel's integrated graphics are always going to be massively inferior to any contemporary graphics cards, but my point here is that this media accelerator is barely enough to effectively drive all of the pixels on my test bench display, let alone actually render any graphics. Even in 2005, the 950 onboard chips were sad, and most of these SFF PCs would have included a basic consumer-grade graphics card. I'm, uh... A little confused as to why this motherboard doesn't even have a PCIe 16X slot or an AGP slot. Because it doesn't. There's totally an empty space for one, which is a little frustrating. Since I was planning on handing this off to somebody who needed it after I was done, I decided to strip it down completely and clean it up. But, oh, lovely. This board is absolutely lousy with bad capacitors. These guys regulate power in the machine, and while they won't necessarily prevent the computer from operating while they're failing like this, running with damaged caps can ruin your components. Which of course doesn't mean I won't be gaming on this pile of garbage, it just means I won't be cursing anyone else with a machine that might crap out at any moment after I'm done. After a complete disassembly, everything got a good cleaning using brushes, swabs, and mild solvents where needed. I was actually surprised at how clean the case fan and CPU cooler were, both requiring only a basic brushing to clean them off. I'm actually pretty impressed with this cooler, and I will totally be figuring out a way to mount this on another board. There is this extra IDE connection on the board that was hanging loose, and which I assumed was for a floppy drive this machine didn't have, but after pulling the cable I noticed there was some corrosion happening with these pins that I couldn't easily clean away, and so I decided to just leave it out when I reassembled everything. For all the proprietary fittings involved with getting a large board like this into such a small case, this thing goes back together pretty easily, after which it was time to install Windows 10 and... Oh. Garbage. This isn't a DVD drive. Alright, how about... Wait, what do you mean it can't boot from USB? The heck? Okay, so Windows 7 and... Wait, seriously, that's a DVD too? How far back do I have to go to... Alright, here we are in Windows XP, with all the drivers reinstalled and everything ready to go. Let's go ahead and fire up 3D Mark 05, which is how far you have to go back to get a version of 3D Mark that'll run in XP. And in a surprise to really nobody, this machine is garbage, barely managing 1 or 2 frames per second during my benchmark run, which didn't actually complete because of course it didn't. To be fair, this is all down to the crap graphics, as during CPU tasks like navigating the OS or watching H.264 video through HTML5 players on YouTube, it actually worked alright. But still, this isn't an auspicious start. Well, let's play some games anyways. Half-Life 2's Lost Coast DLC features a lovely benchmark for the Source engine that... oh geez. <laughs> I had kinda hoped that since Half-Life 2 and this machine were both released the same year that maybe it would be able to handle it on the lowest possible settings, but uh... Nope. 
The benchmark did manage a few spikes up into the very cinematic 24 frames per second range, though that's still not really fast enough for a first person title like this, and the average was more like 8 frames per second. Alright, let's go with the most lightweight modern title I can think of. Windward is less than 500 megabytes installed, and runs just fine in DirectX 9 on several other machines I have. And would you look at this? It's, uh, I mean, totally playable. As long as you don't care that the machine can't render the water. At all. And I'll be honest, having to stare at the purple ocean does actually kind of render the game unplayable, no matter how smooth the frame rates are. Alright, this is me throwing in the towel. 1997's Half-Life is a genre-defining classic and was a graphical masterpiece in its time. And would you look at that, if you go back eight years prior to the release of this computer, you can play AAA titles. Along with what must be the, uh, greatest integrated speaker ever, well, this is technically playable. So I guess the verdict is this. If you are really jonesing for some retro 90s gaming, just taking whatever free PC you can get your hands on is probably going to work just fine for that. But there is absolutely no even sorta modern game that I can get to run playably on this machine. There's no way to upgrade the graphics, and in what is unfortunately not a surprising turn of events for a machine built between 2000 and 2007, the motherboard is lousy with bad capacitors that are bound to irreparably fry the computer at some point. So should you even accept computers like this as a gift? Well, I got a 260 gig hard drive, 1 gig of RAM, and a weird little piece of Intel history out of the deal. Oh, and there was one game that ran just flawlessly. <laughs>